Uh, well, David, they come round separately. Columbia with just Collins in it, that's the big one. We expect to hear from at 8.46. 8.46, that's, uh, what, just about eight minutes or so. And if you want to be precise, at 8.46 and 38 seconds. And then Eagle, that's the one with Armstrong and Aldrin in it, on the way down to the moon if things have gone well. We expect to hear from them at 8.48, 8.48 and 25 seconds. Now, uh, we may not hear right away. Sometimes there's uh, just that agonizing moment when we don't get it, but uh, obviously that is the moment when we will know whether the mission is, by that time, in that particular sphere, 50% successful, they're on course and they're on their way then. Well, David, the uh, times, just for everybody, 8.46, the first hope of news from Collins in Columbia, 8.48, the first hope of news from uh, Armstrong and Aldrin in Eagle on their way to the moon. Uh, I think we just have a, a moment or two, uh, David, before we actually do acquire anything from Houston. Uh, Peter Fairley, can you just remind us now what in fact is going to happen? Well, <clears throat> what should happen is when Mike Collins comes round the side of the moon at 8.46, his spacecraft will be pointing down like this and he will be observing Eagle out of his windows and Eagle itself will report two minutes later and we should hear Armstrong reporting his height which probably will be about 18 miles above the moon his position over the moon's surface and the angle of his approach now, one thing ground control will be watching for is whether he is being pulled off course by some peculiar patches on the moon where gravity is particularly strong now, these are called mascons and they made Apollo 10's Snoopy veer off course by four miles to the left. Well, since Eagle is aiming for a patch of moon only eight miles by two, Armstrong's got to be bang on course. Then at 9.05 will come what Armstrong calls the tricky moment, the last nine miles when he breaks his engine as hard as he can to slow his speed down from 3,800 miles an hour to a mere one mile an hour for the landing. And his engine will cut automatically at the last moment and the spacecraft will literally drop the last five feet. Now, this last drop will be literally the crunch to the whole mission. Uh, Eagle has legs with built-in shock absorbers, but they're only designed to accept a moderately hard thump. And if they squash more than 32 inches or buckle severely, then the men may never get off again. I have, in fact, got one of these shock-absorbing sections of leg here, and you can see it's made of a a soft, crushable, honeycomb aluminium material. And this is designed to take an impact of up to 32 inches without tilting the spacecraft and making it hopeless to get off again. It should be a very exciting moment indeed. Back to Alistair. It certainly should, Peter. And uh, I gather that uh, the moon is visible over Britain tonight, wherever else it isn't visible. There were clouds over London a little while ago, and uh, it wasn't possible to see the moon on this its uh, last night in one particular chapter of history. But there it is, the old moon, the one the cow jumped over, the one the poets wrote about, the one that lovers made love to. And from now on, it's going to be rather a different one. Putting feet down, two and a half, breaking up some dust. Putting feet, two and a half down, straight shadow. Four forward, four forward, drift into the right a little. Break down a half. 30 seconds. Contact right. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Boat control, both auto, descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh... Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're looking good here. Okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. At this moment, the crew are trying to check the angle at which their spacecraft is standing on the moon. All this spacecraft is... systems continue to look very good to us here on the ground. Tranquility Base, Houston, we ex recommend you exit T-12, over.
P12 is a self-checking mode for the computer. This is one of the vital electronics elements that could sustain some possible damage, however slight the shock. The other one is the inertial measuring unit, which is a very finely tuned piece of uh, gear that, that must function. All their early moments will be dedicated to finding out if the fidelity is, is good in those pieces. Those pieces are, in fact, essential, of course, for getting off the moon again. Incidentally, all the time that that spacecraft was landing, a, a film camera was automatically recording the final descent onto the lunar surface through one of the windows. We look forward very much to getting that film back to, to Earth shortly. At the moment, the crew are looking through their windows, in addition to checking their instruments and systems for getting off the moon, and they're trying to work out their precise position on the ground in relation to the maps that they carry inside the vehicle. Shape. Angularity, granularity, and every variety of rock you could uh, find. The color is, uh, well, it varies pretty much depending on uh, how you're looking relative to the uh, zero phase point. Uh, there doesn't appear to be too much of a general color at all. However, it looks as though some of the uh, rocks and boulders, of which there are quite a few in the uh, near area, uh, looks as though they're going to have uh, some interesting colors to them, over. Roger, copy. Sounds good to us, uh, Tranquility. Uh, we'll let you press on through the uh, simulated countdown, and uh, we'll talk to you later, over. Tranquility, we see the now 93. Herb 34. Roger, I assume you want it. Roger. David, the news is good. They're saying that the LEM systems look good. The uh, pointers are not quite, I think, where they set out to be. There's a thought that they overshot their actual landing point by about four miles, but Peter Fair has been following us. Peter, where precisely are they? Well, for anyone who wants to get a map of the moon and actually plot their position, it's 0.799 degrees north, which is virtually bang on the moon's equator. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Good picture, huh? Uh, there's a great deal of contrast in it, and the pressure of 3.5 pounds per square inch. They're now dumping the oxygen from their cabin to make it a vacuum like the moon outside. If they didn't depressurize, the spacemen might be blown out through the hatch like corks out of a rifle, out of an air gun. Oddly enough, though, they do inflate their suits before leaving the cabin, contrary to all the instructions you get in the transatlantic flight, which tells you, in the event of an emergency, to wait until you're out in the water before you inflate your Columbia, waterway. Columbia, this is Houston. Any joy on the lamb? That pass over. Some of the communications there being relayed through the mothership, which is circling still with Michael Collins at the controls 60 miles above. There are many ways in which these men on the moon can communicate with the Earth. They can communicate direct from the moonship to the Earth. Okay, that's in line. Okay. They can communicate through the mothership. And when they're out on the moon, they can relay their communications either direct to the mothership or through the lunar landing vehicle still standing on the moon. Uh, which would bring it up to 2 a.m., I think, and we could expect it that early. EVA, of course, means extravehicular activity, yes. i.e. walk. The time walk. And then, as if to add further emphasis to it, the Public Affairs Office commentator, John McLeish, summarized it 
uh, at the end by saying there is now a very strong possibility that we could have an EDA walk at 8 a.m. Houston time, which would be 2 a.m. our time. It's very small when you're wearing, wearing a clumsy spacesuit and a bulky backpack. There's only a matter of half an inch to spare between the sides of the backpack in some places and the edge of the hatch. They're almost ready now to get out. I'm quite sure the cabin is reading zero pressure now. Their spacesuits would have been fully pressurized. Something like 4.8 pounds. And as we sit here on Earth, we're feeling about 14 and a half pounds pressing in on us. You need at least two and a half pounds to survive. These spacesuits do in fact have a thing called the bladder layer, which is designed to prevent the suit from ballooning outwards. One of the 16 layers in the spacesuit is in fact a ballooning layer, like a football bladder. It keeps the air in and prevents the whole suit from bursting open. I think a uh, good test pilot that he is, Neil Armstrong, will keep us very well informed as he moves down this ladder. We just heard him re call out a suit reading of 4.2 pounds per square inch. And I think he'll be very communicative as he comes down the ladder and describe the ease with which he does the difficulty. It's a ladder which has nine rungs. And there's one interesting thing about the foot pad that lies at the bottom of it. All the other foot pads have steel rods five feet long projecting under them, which were designed to be the first parts of the moon ship that hit the moon. But because this one on the ladder foot pad might have buckled and bent and turned a pointing end upward, which could have snagged or snared or burst open Armstrong's suit, that steel rod was removed. So the lem instead of having four steel rods, only has three. He, in fact, has practiced going down this ladder many, many, many times, and the ladder has specially rounded rivets and rungs, and all parts of it are very smooth, so that the chances of him catching some part of his cumbersome spacesuit is extremely small. Well, it's only a guess, but I would think that he probably have the hatch aside and... Uh... Neil may be testing the ease with which he can back himself out onto the limb front porch and back into the cabin. This is a maneuver he'll practice several times. What would you think, Peter? If you were uh, an inhabitant of the moon looking at him coming through that hatch, you would see the flat soles of his feet coming, coming out five minutes of first. operation on Neil Armstrong's portable life support system now. And as I said, if you were a moon inhabitant, looking up the ladder of the lamb to the port. My RCU there with your mind. You would see the soles of Neil Armstrong's feet coming out first. He would be face down, easing himself out on his stomach. His backpack humped up above him. His feet groping for the first rung, first of the nine rungs on the ladder. Uh, the hatch is coming open. On the porch, it's a small platform at the top of the ladder. Right outside the lunar landing vehicle now. Okay, stand by, Neil. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston. One minute, 30 seconds, LOS. All systems go over. And there you can see the foot going down the ladder. There you can see the whole figure. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming. Yeah, I'm going to step off the lamp now. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. 